Okay, everybody, are we ready? Ready to start? Hey, uh, hey, Vaughn Klontz, could you start us off by uh, just praying for us, praying for our group tonight? Would you do me one favor? Um, Pastor Alexander from Ukraine, just, I was just talking with him, and his two daughters, two youngest daughters, are really sick and have been for a week. Could you just lift them up as we pray for everything tonight? Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, just a, a really nice time that we can stop in the middle of the week, where we can slow down, that we can concentrate our thoughts oh. on you, so we can get through the rest of the week with what we hear here this evening. Uh, Father, there's been a, a request made by Pastor Alexander and, and his family, and especially his daughters. And Father, we, we know that in wintertime, and when it's cold, <laughs> cold flu season and everything, and people get sick, we, we just ask for, for healing for that family. We pray that uh, that they can get back on their feet, that they can, they can feel better, because we know that we, we've kind of lost some spiritual warriors from them being sick. Hmm. And we can, uh, we can use the help and put them back to work. Father, we know that, uh, that your plans are, will be fulfilled in that country. We pray that you will be with those people, that they will never lose their resilience and their zeal for, for the gospel. Father, help us to be uh, the same way. Help us to, to reach people in our community, to tell people that, that we have good news and they need it. They need to hear it. Father, be with us tonight as we go through this study. Give us a good night's rest and prepare us for tomorrow to be your will. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Vaughn. I appreciate that. Hey, thanks for being here tonight. This is uh, week three of the Feast, Festivals, Parties, and Prophecy conversation. And I want to start this week by correcting two things from last week. So I would never intentionally say something that was misleading or wrong or totally not biblical. But sometimes in ignorance and arrogance, I do. And so I said two things last week that I want to kind of go back. I want to get it correct tonight. I want to make sure we all hear it. So the first one is, I even put this on one of the slides. I think it's the first slide, if you don't mind, Terry. Let me just tell you this. Here, here's the deal. Last week, one of the things I said was, uh, as we were talking about Jesus and how he fulfilled that, that first Passover season, I asked the question, how could the Jews miss that? And that's the wrong question because the Jews did not miss that. In fact, um, those first all of the first followers of Jesus were Jewish people, uh, all of them, exclusively. So the Jews did not miss that. Um, 50 days after Passover, 3,000 Jewish men submitted to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Um, there were so many Jewish followers of Jesus in that first century that the Jewish religious leaders got permission from the local governments to round up all Jewish people who were following Jesus and either arrest them or kill them. There were so many. Um, so I, I want to make sure we understand this because this can lead down a bad road. The Jews did not miss Jesus. The religious leaders of the Jews missed Jesus. Does that make, do you see the distinction? So here's what happened. Um, the reason why today Jewish people just don't see Jesus as their Messiah. The, the reason that Jewish people today, not all, but most, like the state of Israel, the state of Jewish uh, people don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah is, in my opinion, you have to go back to 324 AD. Anybody know what happened in 324 AD? You should know this. This is a really important day in history. Constantine in 324 AD made Christianity the quote, religion of Rome. And from that moment on, everything changed. Everything. There was, uh, you never heard about it in seventh grade history, but there was in 324 AD moving forward, a systematic, intentional, programmatic process to eliminate all Jewishness from Christianity. Okay, this is why you know, we kind of got off on a tangent, I did, on that first week about our holidays and how we celebrate them. 
one of the reasons why they're not really on any Jewish holidays is because everybody in that Roman, Holy Roman Empire, where the Christianity is the, quote, official religion, all of them came out of pagan worship and worshiped all these other different things. And so they tried to fit them all in. They wanted to disguise the Jewishness. They wanted to hide the Jewishness of Jesus to the point where uh, they sanctioned killing Jews. And up until about 1700, like AD, like just before America became a country, in Europe, all across Europe, every Easter, um, there was these things called passion plays. You ever heard of a passion play? There's one in Glen Rose, Texas. You can go see it. Um, it's kind of an offshoot of a passion play. And a passion play was just this big reproduction of the life, death, uh, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But up until about 1688, all across Europe, do you know what would happen at the end of every passion play? You should know this. This is really important. They're called pogroms. They would go and round up the local Jews. You know what? Old Joseph lives right down the street. Let's go get him. They would round up the local Jews in the local town at the end of the Passion Play and kill them. They did this up until 1688. It was legal. <laughs> As a people, Jewish people have a deep-seated fear of Christianity and all things Christian, especially Jesus. You can see why, right? So I want to make sure I got that right. Jews did not miss Jesus. Jesus was the fulfillment of the Jewish religion. All the people who followed Jesus at the beginning were Jews, okay? That's the first thing I want to set right. The second thing I want to set right is you asked a question that I misunderstood, and I gave a really poor answer. You asked the question, what happened to the firstborn who died? So we were talking about Passover and how on that night of Passover, the last plague of Passover was that uh, God said he's going to send an angel of death and the firstborn of everybody in Egypt was going to die. And then you asked the question, and I think you were, I answered not knowing what you were asking. You were asking what happened to the souls of those kids that died. That's what you were asking. And I didn't answer that. So here's how I'd answer that. If you look at um, well, Matthew 21, 6, Jesus is speaking and he quotes Psalm 8, 2 which says, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. And then in Ezekiel chapter 16, you see God telling the people how angry he is at the killing of innocent children. And God says these words, they are my children. Uh, and then God told Jeremiah the prophet that he knew Jeremiah when Jeremiah was growing up in Jeremiah's mama's womb. I knew you there. Um, and then Matthew 18, Jesus tells us that there are angels assigned to children who continually see the face of God. So the best answer I could give you is, I don't know why kids had to die, but I do know that the souls of children who have not had the opportunity or the maturity to make their own decision about Jesus, they belong to God. Does that make sense? Children and infants belong to God. His words, they're mine. Does that help? Does that answer it better? Okay. A child, born, <clears throat> a child who is stillborn belongs to God. A child who is aborted belongs to God. Children and infants who don't have the opportunity to grow and make their own decisions about their own sin and a Savior, they belong to Jesus. His words, not mine. And I want to make sure I got that right because I, I really messed that up last week. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? Okay. Yes. If I had a family, and I'm like right now, I'm a 53 year old man, whoever was living in my house at the time, who was my firstborn, would have been killed. In those days, the whole family lived together. You, you could have a 53 year old man and a 40 year old maybe not 40, a 35-year-old son living there. So the firstborn of the household. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Okay, so let's move forward by reviewing a little bit because we got to know some words, right? We got to know three words, ot, moedim, and mikra. These are all three, the Hebrew words that God uses when he 
appoints these feasts and festivals. Uh, every festival has all three of these components. They are signs, they are markers, they are beacons to look for. They are appointed times, appointed, fixed, set by God. Not by man, but by God. And then mikra, which means a rehearsal. So these are signs, beacons, pointing to something ordained, set in place by God. And they're not just a party to, for party's sake. You're to do something as a rehearsal for something to come. You with me? Does this sound familiar? Okay, right on. So uh, more review, there are seven holy days or holidays or festivals designed, ordained, and set in place on the Hebrew calendar, all designed by God. These are the only festivals, parties, celebrations in all of humanity given by God, these seven. Uh, and we've said so far there are uh, four spring festivals, Peshach, which we looked at last week, which starts Passover, which is the first month of the year, which is the first celebration of the year, which makes it the most important of the year. You with me? Tonight, we're going to look at Hag Hamatzah, which is unleavened bread. And then we're going to look at uh, Bikurim, which is first fruits. All three of those happen within the, the week of Passover. And then next week, we'll look at Shavat, which is Pentecost. And then we're going to look at the three fall festivals. One, I think, is already fulfilled. Two, I think, will be. Not yet, though. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Um, three elements. Every one of these feasts had three elements that you have to be aware of. There's an agricultural element, the historical element, and the prophetic element. Okay? So, last week we talked about Pentecost, or, uh, Passover, which is the celebration, the remembrance of that whole event in Exodus 12, um, where God is taking the people out of Egypt, and it's that 10th plague, and God is going to send the angel of death and kill all the firstborn all throughout the land. But if you sacrifice the lamb in a certain way at a certain time, and then take the blood and smear it over the doorposts of your house, when the angel would see the blood, he would pass over, right? That's, the whole, that's what the whole thing means. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about that whole smeared blood because it's important. Because that word, when you smear the blood, is mashak. It means to smear the blood. So God would say, if you want to save your family, you have to smear the blood. You have to mashak the blood over your doorpost. Fast forward, 1,500 years later, a child is born in Bethlehem, which we talked about the, the significance of Bethlehem, and it's the house of bread, and all the best lambs for Passover are born there. And what is his name? What is that child's name? Jesus. And what's his title? Not his last name, but Christ, right? In the scriptures, we call him Jesus Christ. That's the Greek form of his name. Jesus was not his name. His name was Yeshua, Hebrew. Do you know what that word means? Yeshua? You should know it. You should know what Yeshua means. It means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. Okay? Christ is a Greek word. It's a translation of a Hebrew word, Mashiach. Do you know what that word means? Messiah. Do you know what it comes from? You know what the word Mashiach comes from? Meshach, which is smeared blood. So when you say the name of Jesus, what you're actually saying is Yahweh saves through the smeared one. Jesus' name implies salvation and his title, Christ, it's not his last name, it's his title, literally means he is the smeared one, the one whose blood would be smeared so that all of us could be saved. Isn't that amazing? I mean, even, even in his name, he is revealing who he is and what he's done. And they have been looking for that for 1,500 years. And those religious leaders failed to see it. You with me? All right, Passover, sacrifices, the specifics. Select an unblemished lamb. Select uh, the lamb on the 10th day of the month. Observe, test the lamb for five days. Then slaughter the lamb before twilight. The lamb would be prepared at nine 
and then killed at three in order to have time to cook and eat the lamb by six. So what we said last week was that all of those events surrounding the death of Jesus all line up exactly to the hour with the historical and prophetic observances of Passover. Remember that? If you're here last week, we talked about how all those things, Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, Jesus is being tested for five days, the time he was hung on the cross, the time he died, they all match up perfectly to the hour with the 1,500-year celebration of Passover. Um, so today, we're going to look at the two more feasts that happened during Passover week. Passover was the first one. There's two more. There's one right after Passover, the next day. So it's called Hag Hamatzah, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And man, I wish the Helixons were here because they asked the question that I want you to talk about around your table. Uh, they asked it last week. How many of you have read Exodus 12 already? Okay, we read it last week. And their question was, what's the deal with all the yeast? <laughs> which is such a good question. So what I want you to do is just take a couple minutes and, and talk about that at your table. Answer that question for the Helixons and we'll uh, send them this video some other time. What's the deal with all the yeast? That's the table talk question. What do you think? If you need to re be reminded, we've got a few minutes, take Exodus 12 and you can see all the talking about yeast, but I want you to talk about it at your table and then we'll, we'll reconvene in a minute. <laughs> don't look at us, don't look at us. All right. I hear Casey has a good answer. Let's hear it. Yep. Did you hear that? Casey said um, at midnight when Pharaoh said, get out, they had to hurry. They had to get out. So they didn't have time to let their bread rise. Right? Part of it. What'd you guys come up with? What's with all the yeast? Okay. Of? But so, so Casey's pointing out the historical thing that we're in a hurry, you need to be ready. And you're saying there's a symbolic element to it and it's a tiny little thing that has this huge impact. You're right on track. What do y'all have over there? Anything? Anything to add? Nothing? Y'all got anything to add? Y'all have anything to add? So the yeast has a symbolic representation to sin. Okay. And that's why they got out of their houses. It's not just not eat it, just do it, get rid of it, period. Okay. Did y'all come up with anything different? What everybody else said? Y'all? Yeah. Basically, that, that, uh, like you were saying, <coughs> the school of thought that yeast has the symbolic of sin. And since when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Yep, we're going to get there. You ready? Let's look at Leviticus. People moan and groan when you're reading the Bible through in a year or when some preacher says we're going to look at Leviticus, people go, oh, all the rules. Oh. Let me tell you something. If you read Leviticus, looking back through the lens of, oh, it's all pointing to Jesus, you don't go, oh, with all the rules. You go, oh, how about that? No wonder so many of them recognize Jesus, because it's right there. So Leviticus 23 is a re-giving of the instructions. Um, and here's what uh, the scripture says. The Lord's Passover, that's what happened last night in our little timeline, begins at sundown on the 14th day, because that's when the new day starts on the Hebrew calendar, when the sun goes down the 14th day of the first month. On the next day, 
which is the 15th day of the month, you must begin celebrating the festival of unleavened bread. This festival to the Lord continues for seven days. And during that time, the bread you eat must be made without yeast. On the first day of the festival, all the people must stop their ordinary work and observe an official day for holy assembly. For seven days, you must pre present special gifts to the Lord. On the seventh day, the people must again stop all their ordinary work to observe an official day for holy assembly. So, unleavened bread is a seven-day festival, but the first day is really important. Okay, so let's look at the agricultural element, which is the first thing. Remember, Passover starts the whole... Um, it's the uh, barley harvest season. So this is day two of barley harvest season. So it's all around that time. Um, the historical element is you need to look back and remember that when I called you out of Egypt, I wanted you to be ready to move quickly and I wanted you to be ready to leave Egypt. That's what they're supposed to around the table talk about. Remember how our ancestors had to be ready we had, we had to have our sandals laced up. We had to have our travel clothes on. And we were in such a hurry, we couldn't let the bread rise. We just had to go, go fast because we were leaving Egypt. Huge story. So those are the two um, agricultural and historical elements. Exodus 12, so I want to go back to it. I know you've read it, but let's check this out. So God says, celebrate this festival of unleavened bread for it will remind you Look back, that I brought your forces out of the land of Egypt on this very day. So this was a 15, by, by the time Jesus came around, this was a 1500 year old celebration to the day. This is the birthday of leaving Egypt. Does that make sense? This festival will be a permanent law for you. There's not going to be an end to this. You're going to always celebrate it. Celebrate this day from generation to generation. The bread you eat must be made without yeast. From the evening of the 14th day of the first month, which is the day Jesus was killed, until, uh, until the evening of the 21st day of the month, seven days later. So up to this point, here's what they were supposed to be remembering. We've had two parties back to back. One was Passover, the next night, is unleavened bread. So Passover, they were to remember, I protected you from death. I passed over your house because you smeared blood and I protected you. On the unleavened bread, I want you to remember the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I brought you out of Egypt, out of 400 years of slavery, out of 400 years of no identity, just slaves. So remember that I protected you from death, Remember that I brought you out of Egypt. Now let's look at leaven or yeast. In the Hebrew culture, because of Passover, yeast came to represent two things. It came to represent bondage in Egypt, which makes sense. But more importantly, it came to represent sin. And for all the reasons you guys said, it's a tiny little thing, but it has this blow up effect. Literally, it blows stuff up, right? And so the tiniest little sin has this huge effect. And so they were to think of yeast, not just as um, something that you put in your bread to make it nice, but it represents for an entire nation of people sin in our lives. And what should we do with it? And how do we get rid of it? And how do we deal with all this stuff? So that's why this whole, this whole feast was instituted. Um, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul, who was a, one of the most scholarly Jewish men alive, he knew the law more than anyone. He said, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Have you heard this verse before? This is a really important verse when it comes to salvation, that there was this man, Jesus, who had lived a perfect life, but at some point, although he had no sin, he literally became sin. You with me? 
Then John, who followed Jesus every day for three years, he said this, you know that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in him. Those two verses for me make a lot more sense knowing that those two men were Jewish men who grew up every year of their lives celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread and talking about yeast and talking about leaven and doing what um, the Bible calls the purging of leaven. Okay, this was how they would prepare for this festival. They would do four things. They would identify the leaven in their home. They would go home and they would identify the leaven and they would gather all the leaven. And what this looked like was move the couch out, move the TV out, move the dresser out, take the clothes out. Literally, you would empty your house and you would sweep the ceilings and you would sweep the corners and you would sweep the floors and you would do this every year. You, would go, you were like militant about getting the tiniest gram of yeast out of your house. Did any of you all do spring cleaning? Do you know that this is where spring cleaning came from? Literally, this is where spring cleaning came from. This is in the spring. And for thousands of years, Jews have been emptying their homes and cleaning them all out because it's spring and we're celebrating this thing. We have to figure out where the yeast is and we have to get it out. So they would identify it. They would gather it. They would then put it in what we would call like a little envelope or scoop it in a dustpan or something like that. They would take the leaven and you had to take it out of your house. It had to cross the threshold of your house so it's no longer in your house. But that wasn't enough. Then you have to take that leaven, which represents sin, and you have to dig a hole in the ground and bury it. <coughs> Some rabbis taught you had to burn it, but God told them to bury it. Is this ringing any kind of bell? Yeah. You, you, hang on. You have this man, Jesus, who two different men said he didn't have any sin, but he became sin. And this Jesus died on the exact moment, the exact hour that the Passover lamb was killed. And now on the day when all Jews for 1,500 years had been taking all the leaven out of their house that represented sin, taking it out of their house, taking it away and burying it. This is the day. Let's go to the next slide. This is the day on the same days that all the Jews were burying or burning the leaven the sinless body of Jesus was buried. Outside the walls, they had to take the body. They crucified him outside the city walls, so he was outside of the household, and they buried him in a hole in the ground, just like Jews had done to their sin, their leaven, for 1,500 years. And it was supposed to be a rehearsal, right? It wasn't just supposed to be a party. It wasn't just supposed to look back. You were also supposed to look forward. So for 1,500 years... Jews were not just burying the sin in a hole in the ground. Somewhere in their brains, they had to be thinking, someday, some man is going to fulfill this. this is so, we're practicing for something that's coming. And John and Paul and all those guys, they assumed it was Jesus. So that's the, let's look at the last of the three Passover feasts, okay? That's unleavened bread. So, so far, we've had Jesus killed. We've had Jesus hung on a cross uh, died and then buried all at the same time that these two feasts we've looked at so far say he should have been. Does that make sense? Here's the third one, Bikurim, first fruits. Um, this is, golly, three days after Passover. Can you believe that? For 1,500 years, three days after Passover, three days after the sacrifice of a lamb, they would celebrate this crazy holiday. Um, the agricultural element is this. They would walk out into the field if you were a farmer uh, and they would find the best of the first sheafs of grain to ripen. When the little, whatever it is, opens up and you can see the seeds of grain on a stalk, they would go and pick that. That was called first fruits. And since not everybody was a farmer, it became part of the religion that the high priest would go out into a special field and he would be the one who would pick one sheaf of grain that would be the sheaf of grain for this festival for all of God's people. Does that make sense? So one man would go out, pick one sheaf to fulfill this prophecy or to do this festival, and it would be for all of us. 
Okay? Yep, that's the word. Sheaf. S H E A F. Leviticus 23 9. Here's what the Bible says The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land, I'm going to give you the land I'm going to give you, and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to take that sheaf and wave the sheaf before the Lord. So it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after Sabbath. Kind of weird, right? But the priest would, would recognize it as, oh, this is good. This is a choice piece of thing. And it's going to represent a harvest for everybody. This one little thing represents a harvest for everybody that's going to feed everybody and supply everybody's need. So remember these three celebrations. Passover, I protected you from death. Unleavened bread, I brought you out of Egypt. First fruits celebrates the moment, the day that God parted the sea and the Israelites crossed through on dry land. The Egyptian army chased them. The sea closed up over them. The Egyptian army and Pharaoh totally wiped out, and now Israel is free. So this festival celebrates that day. It's the holiday to celebrate the day you actually got taken from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from old to new. You with me? Okay. So the historical element, it's three days after Passover. The high priest would would walk out into the, the Valley of Kidron, and he would pick one sheaf of grain, that would represent all the people, and it was a symbol of the entire harvest. The prophetic element. According to Scripture, there was a timing involved here. We can look at it. Um, The priest would go out three days after Passover, just before the sun came, went down, so that he could pick that sheaf of grain right before the new day started. We know from Scripture that that's the moment Jesus was resurrected. So in your brain, when the high priest is out there picking the one sheaf of grain that's going to represent a harvest for all of the people, that's the moment, according to John and Matthew, that Jesus was resurrected just before the next day. Isn't that amazing? The same time. Um, Here's what Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And listen to what Paul calls Jesus. He calls Jesus the first fruits. He literally uses the word, bikarim. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ... The first fruits, said it twice in this paragraph, when he comes, those who belong to him. So here's what I want you to see, and then I have some table talk for you. Passover season, we have a seven-day window to celebrate. The first day is Passover. That's the day Jesus was killed, and he died at the appointed time, just the right time. The next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the same day in the same hour that Jesus was buried at the appointed time. And then three days after that, Jesus was resurrected at the appointed time when the high priest is out there picking the first fruits that would represent the whole harvest. You with me? So there's three things, the first three uh, of the big feasts. So the table talk I want you to talk about is, I just want, what's your conclusion? What's your conclusion about these first three, Passover season, the one, two, three, bam, bam, bam parties, and the the coincidence or the timing, whatever word you want to use, what's your conclusion out of what you've learned so far? And I want to hear what's happening at your table. What are y'all's conclusions about what we've talked about so far? Since he has 
came and fulfilled all of that, did those festivals end, or are we still supposed to, you know, celebrate them every year? Are you Jewish? No. And that's, you know. I asked you to make conclusions, not ask questions. Y'all need to follow directions over there. <laughs> that's a great question. And I started this three weeks ago by saying, I'm not going to, I would never tell you, you need to convert to Judaism and you need to celebrate these, these parties. I don't think that's, that's not the point at all. Our goal is to understand why they're significant. God doesn't do anything randomly. God doesn't do anything accidentally. Everything he does has a purpose. And so if there are only seven holidays instituted by the creator of the universe, and our Savior celebrated them, we should at the very least just understand them. Just honor God uh, uh, enough to understand why he instituted those things. That's all, I'm, that's all we're doing. How you celebrate Easter, how you celebrate Christmas, how you celebrate your salvation, I think that's between you and God, not me telling you, here's what you should do. Because we are not under the law. Number one, we're not God's chosen people. We're not Israel. And number two, we're not under the curse of the law. God has not required you as a Gentile to keep that festival. Does that make sense? The Jewish people still keep them. They still celebrate all of these. They just can't see it. Some of them just can't see it. How about y'all? What did y'all come up with? Any conclusions or more questions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But also questions of like, why am I 40 and I've never heard, I mean, I've heard of the Passover and I've heard of the first fruits and I've heard of all those things, but not all this together. And I feel like this, this particular study I need to pass on to hmm. my children, you know? Like, I am not a conspiracy guy <laughs> at all. Ed and I, when we sit down and talk, he convinces me and I try to convince him otherwise. But I do think that there is, there's a spiritual battle going on all around us. And if these things are true, if these things are from God, then we have an enemy who doesn't want us to understand those things. And since 324 AD, there has been a systematic attempt to eradicate all of this from understanding who Jesus is. I think we're still feeling the effects of that. Nobody teaches this in seminary. No, I, I promise you, there has never been a pastor graduate from Southwestern Seminary, any Baptist seminary, who has been taught any of this. Because it's, well, because it's Jewish. It. Do what? Pastors don't teach it because they don't understand it. Probably. I mean. And it's a shame because I, I think you can see just how rich yes. this stuff is. I mean, it's so... I, we're skimming the surface of it. We could take a couple weeks and do each feast and all the particular details. <laughs> what, how about conclusions back there? Y'all come to any conclusions? Negative? No conclusions? We just basically said that, you know, it wasn't a coincidence. It was ordained. It was set in motion. You don't think that the, all those events lining up perfectly is a coincidence? Mm -hmm. Okay. You got six hundred laws. You, you bust one, you go get a calf, you cook it. You, I, I mean, in a nutshell, yeah, that's it. You had people that had to go on a trip, they had to go quick. You take the leaven out, you, you get dressed, you get ready, you wolf that food down and you head to the Red Sea as quick as you can go. I mean it all it's, it's all a timeline. Then you've got the old testament, you've got all these stories. And then all of a sudden, when you finish the book of uh, Malachi, holy cow, you start reading these things that read it. There's this baby that's born. You go back to Isaiah. Thousands of years before.
and they're they're telling you this is going to happen. You're not going to see it, but your descendants probably will. Get ready for it. Put these thoughts in your children's minds. Put these these uh, these holidays, these festivals, into your children's hearts. You won't see them, but your children's children's children. Yep. So I mean, it, it's amazing the way that it flows. You read about this this great event that's going to happen in the New Testament. There it is. Conclusions over here? Pretty much the same thing as everyone else said, other than we kind of talked about what has been fulfilled already and what are, what are we still rehearsing for. Okay, thank you for asking that. I want to ask you a question, though, as a math guy. <laughs> Is it possible to calculate the odds of one human being being a person who fulfilled three of those seven? One human being out of all human beings from the time creation to whenever. Is it possible to calculate the odds? And if so, how big a number is that? They have done that, and I don't know how deep it is, but it's the equivalent of, I think it was like eight inches of quarters all across the state of Texas. That's the eight major prophecies in the Old Testament. I'm, I'm talking about something different. I think these odds are even better. I mean, even bigger. There's eight major prophecies. There's 300 total prophecies about the Messiah and who he was and right. things that would happen. The odds of one man in all of history just fulfilling eight is the equivalent of taking one silver dollar, pending it red, throwing it on Texas, then filling Texas four feet high with silver dollars and saying, you have one shot, pick it out. That's the odds of just fulfilling eight. But I'm saying, what are the odds of one man fulfilling just three of those festivals that have been going on for 1,500 years. I think it's immense. It, it's way bigger. I don't find this to be coincidental at all. I just, I just see God having this amazing plan. So, um, and our time is over and was two minutes ago, but let me just do two things. The first three festivals, I, my personal opinion, you can come to your own conclusions, Jesus fulfilled them all without question, in my mind. There's another one coming. 50 days after Passover, there's a party called, well, we call it Pentecost. They called it Shabbat. And we're going to look at that next week. And you're not going to believe this, but something happens that is a, is a fulfillment of the prophetic element that had been celebrated for 1,500 years. <laughs> Go figure. So uh, your homework is to read Exodus 32 because you can't understand Pentecost without first understanding Exodus 32. So what we're going to see next week is four of the seven, the first four fulfilled by Jesus and the spirit of Jesus. And then we're going to move to the fall festivals. And Matthew's question was, if he's fulfilled those three and next week four, are there some that we're still rehearsing for? And the answer is, uh-huh. <laughs> and you're going to see in the celebration of the fall festivals, the festivals that come at the end, how they really line up with the way Jesus said things would end. It's amazing. So for next week, read Exodus 32, okay? All right, let me pray for us. We'll go.